Phil Purnell to score beautifully and excite Rovers supporters. But City has clever free kick coming up now. Andy May is involved at the start. He gets forward to be involved again. Lovely centre. Bob Taylor's airborne. That's the equaliser. Well, City moving well now, and uh, Rovers' defence really in a mess and allows new teenager from Watford, Eddie Harrison, their number five, to show his persistence. And that brings the chance for teenager Robert Edwards, signed from Carlisle last season, to score. Edwards looked good last night. Busy Harrison again. Wayne Allison's effort comes back off the goal frame. Bob Taylor helps himself. City 3-1 ahead after 40 minutes. Now watch Alexander appear to stamp on David Smith after the winger had centred the ball. There's the stamp. Certainly the linesman thought so. Called the referee over. Alexander sent off. His second dismissal in Derby is at Ashton Gate. Rovers came back, though. Carl Saunders cleverly set up Mayhew. He takes the chance perfectly, so it's only 3-2 at half-time. But more self-destruct for Rovers now after 70 minutes. Watch Twentyman's foul on Allison there. The referee ruled the City man would have been away to score, so he sent Twentyman off under the so-called professional foul rule. Well, at today's photo call, Rovers' new manager, Martin Dobson, said he'll be instructing Alexander to mend his ways. That was David Lawrence. This is Jeff Twentyman telling me that he claims his foul was unintentional and he is considering appealing to the FA against his suspension. Now, David Lawrence. Yes, the sunshine start there at Twerton Park as the Rovers uh, turn out for the new season after two good seasons. How will they do now? Yeah, I think so. I football anyway, so I mean, it's... Uh... Can't get around quick enough for me, football season. Been coming for three or four years. Hopefully, we'll have a fair season, but I can't see nothing spectacular. I think we'll be middle of the table team, which would be good for us, because we haven't spent a lot of money on players, but uh, we'll be there. Well, promotion would be nice, wouldn't it? Both teams, hopefully, keep us in a job. Are you regular? No, it's the first time I come. Yeah, so what are you hoping to see this afternoon? A few goals. The varying opinions there of football supporters on their way for the start of the season at Bristol Rovers against Ipswich. As you were saying in the studio, a sunshine start to the uh, season. Some clouds coming across here. The Rovers have one or two clouds, let's face it. Uh, today they're missing one of their best players at the back, Vaughan Jones, and uh, Carl Saunders, their leading scorer, missing. But they're going to bring in some fresh young talent today. Let's hope it works for the Rovers. We're here to find out. Well, it went badly uh, starting after 13 minutes. Watch for Andy Reese trying to get a back pass going. It goes wrong, Yallop intercepts. And as Jason Dozell shoots, Steve Yates attempts to block, but can only divert it into the other side of his own net. Happy Ipswich fans. Now it's second half and uh, Rovers ought to have equalised. Watch for young Marcus Stewart. He's the new lad, the 18-year-old from Witherwood. He's brought down, that's a penalty. Ian Alexander makes a mess of it. So it's still going wrong for Rovers. Another error now, uncharacteristic by Jeff Twentyman, allows Chris Kiwamia to get away, and he sets up Paul Goddard, who once cost a million pounds and is used to taking chances like that. Well, Ipswich must have thought Christmas had come early now. Rovers' defence really in a mess, and as Stockwell shoots, why, it's another own goal. It's Ian Alexander, and the defenders are not getting on at all well with each other. Still, there is time left yet if a recovery can be staged, and believe me, it was. And watch the Ipswich defence allowing young Marcus Stewart there to score his first league goal. The young boy's inclusion now justified. And the six and a half fans, six and a half thousand fans beginning to think their journey was worthwhile. More so when A.D. Boothroyd gets forward from the back. Rovers now beginning to smell something, and uh, Big Devon White makes it 2-3. Yes, and the big fella now begins to see that uh, Game on, and the crowd really now alive with the interest. Can this game be saved? Well, there's eight minutes left when Jeff Twentyman hoists a long free kick. White pivots. Yes, he gets it past the Canadian international Craig Forrest, and that's a marvellous recovery. Rovers had been awful to start with, but they'd really brought home the bacon for their happy crowd. Rovers three, Ipswich three. The Friday night favourites were playing last night. Uh, the yes. opening Leeds match at home against Bristol the Rovers and went a goal behind a very good goal there by Marcus Stewart. Well taken, wasn't Yeah, it? a couple of minutes before half time. Mm. But Tran by uh, yeah, a minute later. Been, yeah, yeah, this this uh, good good headed ball down there actually. Dave Higgins pulled down there. Uh, 
for the uh, oh, oh, and it's our old pal Neil Midge. Midge has given it. Well done. And here's the man himself, John Aldridge. So you and don't think that this penalty kick is legal now, do you? I the don't Aldridge think... It, I know it isn't legal, actually. This check-in isn't allowed. Uh, you do it on the continent because the goalkeeper's normally standing at your feet by the time you take it. But uh, really, it shouldn't be allowed. But here they go again. Big Jim, steel Jim at the far post. The Typical post. goal That's for Big right. Jim, this is yeah. a beauty. Oh, yeah. you go, big fella. Yep, standard procedure. Huh? So it looked at that particular point, I'm sure, Jim, that it was going to be all over. 2 1 for Tranmere into the last minute. Yeah. And would you believe the penalty? You? Oh! Never a penalty, I didn't Well, well, Mr. Neil, Midgley. no, Neil. Mr. Midgley thought so. Well oh, done, no. Neil. Well, Marcus Stewart, who'd uh, scored previously, takes the penalty, a bit of pressure on him, knocks it in. And it finishes at 2 2, Jim. Huh? But anyway, after this, it's been a wonderful start to the season oh, for Jim Wilson. Early danger for uh, Bristol Rovers as Tranmere combined well there and it's Aldridge uh, showing his positioning on that occasion but not his deadly finishing. Now Ian Wilmot's corner leads to the goal. Devon White gets it down and Wilmot, dynamic strike. Second goal in his first two league games. Have another look at it. Now that's really good finishing, isn't it? Keeping the ball down and getting his reward. So Rovers in the lead through their uh, sparkling new recruit. Now this is where... Uh, the penalty is given against Steve Yates there. Referee Neil Midgley in no doubt. Have a look now. There is the tackle. Does come in. The Tranmere man does go over. It's Dave, it's Dave Higgins, the right fullback. And John Aldridge uh, gobbles these up, doesn't he? That's his sixth goal in his first three games since his £250,000 signing from Real Sociedad. When a second half and it's John Morrissey exciting the Merseyside crowd, but Rovers goalkeepers from Merseyside to Brian Parkin and inspired on the occasion. Now, this is where Jim Steele puts Rovers behind. Climbs well, doesn't he, the big fella? Good header. 2-1 to Tranmere. 11 minutes left, and Rovers now quickly getting uh, the ball into the box. And this is where the penalty is given against... Dave Wilson, the Rovers man there, protests. It will lead to booking, bookings for Mark Hughes and for Higgins. But uh, Martin Della judged to have nudged Wilson. Referee Neil Midgley there, booking ex-Rovers man Hughes and Higgins for the protests. All the time, the tension building up now. Who's going to take the penalty? Ian Alexander missed one for Rovers last week. They've given it to the youngest man in the side, young Marcus Stewart. And he's got an old head on young shoulders, as you'll see next. The home crowd are booing and hissing. He keeps his cool. He knocks it home. His third goal in two league games. What a good away result for his team. Their marking lacked tightness, and Liam O'Brien was unloading a fine shot into the back of their net. Then early second-half penetration by the famous black-and-white stripes, and although goalkeeper Parkin had often rescued the Rovers, he couldn't deny Mick Quinn. Well, too late, two minutes from time, the Rovers did get a goal back. A new signing, Justin Skinner, the scorer, after coming on as a sub, but there will be other changes for the match against City. Welcome back. We were Rovers with unbeaten City aiming to go to the top of the second division. Rovers, in contrast, seeking their first league win of the season. Your match commentator on the Bristol Derby at Ashton Gate is Roger Malone. A warm welcome to Ashton Gate and look straight away then at the City lineup. There's hot competition for the two striker places and tonight it's Wayne Allison and Nicky Morgan getting the start with Bob Taylor on the bench. Nicky Morgan, leading scorer with 17 goals last season, earns tonight's start by coming on as a scoring substitute at Port Vale on Saturday. The Rovers reshape as they look for a first win. They bring in reserve centre-back Billy Clark. Are they going to try a sweeper system? Certainly teenage midfielder Lee Archer gets a league debut and experience Phil Pennell, a first league start of the season. At outside left, Carl Saunders, who was leading scorer last season, but suspended until tonight. He's on the bench. Well, there's Lee Archer getting his chance as new manager Martin Dobson again puts his trust in new blood. And tonight's referee, Martin Boddenham from Cornwall. And it's City kicking off in the red tops, playing right to left. City fourth from top of the table, eight points 
from their first league games. The Rovers, fourth from bottom, two points from three games. So the first corner of the match for Bristol City. Last spring they ended Rovers' 10-game unbeaten run in this series. Our City going to stay on top tonight. The first corner kick. Rennie up in the air. May again. Clark got a boot on it. This is Smith. And goal kick to Bristol Rovers. David Smith, the man that City will look to supply as often as possible to use that well-known speed of his. Scott. Hazelman. Allison finding good space tonight. Rennie. Llewellyn. Oh, just quick to him. Young lad did well there. Took it off the experienced player. What can he make of it? Looking for Pennell outside, Pennell not there. Skinner is. So Stewart, Reese lets fly. Andy Reese, they're not able to add uh, execution at the death to a good Rovers move. And Archer makes good use of uh, winning that possession, and Rovers build up nicely. He sees Pennell is not there, available outside left, so he puts it inside. Skinner's there. It's knocked back for Reese by young Stewart, and then the shot lets the team down. Boothroyd to Stewart to Skinner Scott to Azenwood taking the ball forward May who slotted back to right foot Junior Bent the substitute May a lovely ball to Bent the cross is there, chance for Shelton, couldn't control it. May's lovely pass has, relief, has released Bent. Shelton's read it nicely, gets onto the square ball, but can't quite control it, and Rovers survive. Bryant shaping for that long throw. Morgan, squaring it, chance. Oh, my goodness me, Dave Rennie. What a wonderful opening. Well worked move. The value of the long throw. Challenge in the air from City. Morgan knows what he's doing, touches it back. Rennie's got forward, but he just can't get it through the bodies and on target. Oh, good glance by Allison. Bent. Allison. Smith. Scott. And it's a wonderful save there by Parkin from Julia Bent. Bent came stealing in on the cross, did everything right. Parkin was superb. Scott arrows it in. Allison does well in the air. There goes Bent getting to the ball, and what a save. And so the corner kick taken by Bent, cleared by Rhodes. Back to May. Well, a pile driver there from Andy May. Brian Parkin's busy, but he's up to it. And Keith Welsh hasn't had much to do that's bothered him so far. Bent 
against Yates. Bent speed takes him there. Chance for Morgan. Not connected with, got, got well to the ball, but miscued the volley. Lovely example of the way bent speed is an asset. Nicky Morgan gets to it. It's a chance. Boothroyd's tackle. Shelton's throw. Smith. Shelton's cross. Cleared by Yates. White. Not very determined for him. City have it. May. To Bryant. There's a likely name. May. Billy Clark's up well. Morgan has it. Shot him by Shelton. Once again, Miss Q. City so far have not got those shooting boots on. Once again, City's ideas and control make an, op an opening, but once again, the finishing there by Shelton is totally Miss Q. <laughs> so a half time score then of no score. Uh, Bristol City really ought to have been in front by now. And I would expect to see substitute Bob Taylor brought into the second half by them if the score remains Bristol City nil, Bristol Rovers nil. So Rovers get the second half of the Bristol derby flowing. Rovers must be delighted to be still alive at nil-nil. City must be very disappointed not to have had the game won by now. So much possession uh, and openings did they have and create in the first half without making any use of them. Andy May filling it at right fullback because Llewellyn's off with a hamstring injury. Nothing serious apart from the fact he can't play any more part in this game. Purnell for Rovers. Devon White. Archer looking to find Purnell, but May covering up. Andy May has taken part in the uh, amusing amount of possession that City have had but it hasn't been very amusing for their supporters in a way that May and Co have made nothing of it. Allison. Yates playing as the back man in a new sweeper system Rovers brought in to come over here and try and uh, get a point. Dennis Rofe, the Rovers coach. He's looking uh, reasonably pleased and he's entitled to. Bryant. Allison. Twentyman's with him. Bent has it. The chip. Goal should be no. Morgan will never know how he didn't just nod that home. Shelton applauds the move. Lovely work by Allison. Bent knocks it across. There's Morgan. Thank you very much indeed, but he flicked that head too early. He doesn't often do that. Stewart's moved nicely. Good control by the youngster. And he's made a jump for Skinner. And a good save. Oh, yes, and completed by Scott. And Skinner, very annoyed. He didn't give Rovers the lead there. It was an excellent move. Stewart makes it. Real class from the youngster. Skinner's moved well. Good save by Welsh. And Scott is quick to cover. Bryant. Bent three. In it comes Allison. Yes, it's there. Wayne Allison puts City ahead. And about time two, their crowd think. The man who did the line well all along through the night finally took the chance, made by the speed of Junior Bent. Bent's got away. Allison knows he's only got to hit the target now. Bristol City. Give Julio Bent a yard and speed and you're not going to catch him. And here comes
comes the old motto, if you keep the shot low, it often gets home. Goalkeepers can't get down as well as they can get up. So 20 minutes into the second half, Bristol City won, Bristol Rovers nil. Scott still has it. Smith. Good ball to Scott. And a sharp low step. Trying to surprise Parkin, who declined to join in. Tonell. To Bryant. That's Smith. Scott's backed up well, and instead of chipping it, he tries to surprise the keeper with a low one, but Parkin had seen it all before. Well saved. Matt Bryant with a cheeky ball back there to Scott. Super football by City on occasions, but their finishing was never really sharp. Not until the 65th minute, when Wayne Allison got the vital goal. kick after four minutes of added time Pennell hoists it City play the offside trick they put themselves in trouble chance for 20 men marvellous save by Welsh my goodness me that's what they paid £200,000 for for this boy City's offside trap sprung a chance for 20 men and that's good goalkeeping spread himself stayed cool blocked the shot So Martin Bonnerdam brings the Bristol Derby to an end. A deserved win for the home side by one goal to nil. Their fans celebrate their side, still unbeaten, moving towards the top of that table. And there's the man who got the vital goal, Wayne Allison, the outstanding player for me in the match. City might have had two, three or four, but they got the victory they deserve. And now they put together two winning Bristol Derbies. And that hasn't happened for a long time. Final score. Bristol City won. Bristol Rovers nil. Wayne Allison. Uh... A few problems in attack where Devon White was only just wide with an early header on Saturday. But in defence, Dobson clay claims Rovers are not making the decisions, making the other side making it difficult for the opposition. Here Grimsby allowed to develop an attack on the left. Rovers only managed to clear through Steve Yates head and Andy Reese's boot. That though gave them a chance for Marcus Stewart to exploit his pace, the shot going just wide. Grimsby though took the lead on 39 minutes. Again clever play down the left, the one-two between Dave Gilbert and ex-City man Murray Jones. Gilbert's pass then to Kevin Jobling, the left back's superb shot. Rovers drew level for the first time just after the interval. Ian Alexander slipping past his man, Devon White's glancing header, one all. But Rovers' slackness in defence again allowed Grimsby to go in front. Woods getting past Yates, his pass finding Jones in space. He shoots under the diving parking. Rovers, though, weren't beaten yet. Ale Ian Alexander's free kick was blocked and his volley diverted, but straight into the path of Richard Evans. The first goal for the £30,000 buy from Weymouth. But just when Rovers fans were celebrating the draw, Grimsby's outstanding forward, Dave Gilbert, broke clear on the left. Plenty of space. His shot hitting the underside of the bar and leaving Rovers still without a win. The start for Rovers couldn't have been worse. Former captain Vaughan Jones playing his first game of the season fell awkwardly in his first challenge just seconds after the kickoff. It's been confirmed that the unfortunate Jones has a broken leg. Well, Rovers' best chance came after a long kick from keeper Parkin. Carl Saunders latching onto a Devon White header 
but just wide. Oxford were now well on top and Rovers had Ian Alexander to thank for preventing them from going one down. Ten minutes later though and the visitors' pressure was rewarded. David Penny in acres of space shooting past Parkin. Rovers' response though was immediate. Steve Cross brought down just outside the area. And Ian Alexander, having saved Rovers at one end, was to put them on level terms. A slow motion replay will show just how accurate that strike had to be through a sea of defenders. Well, in the second half, Rovers began to take control. White gives Boothroyd a run on the right. His cross is just out of reach of Steve Yates. And White was again involved when Rovers got their winners. He set up debutant Steve Cross to lift the ball home. White's aerial power again decisive, and look at that for a cool finish from Steve Cross, seeing the visitors' goalkeeper off his line. Well, after an untidy opening 25 minutes from both teams, Port Vale began to link some skillful moves, and Rovers were to require a superb save from Brian Parkin to deny the Dutchman van der Laan. But Rovers were the first to score. Mayhew forces the ball down, Carl Saunders gets it in the net. Saunders had shown his typical goal urgency. Port Vale level though within two minutes. Martin Foyle's header is downward and sharp. Parkin claws it back, but an alert referee said it had crossed the line. Port Vale behind again with an unnecessary goal. Yannick should have cleared there, and Saunders catches in. Saunders, last season's Rovers leading marksman, back in business again. The mid-table visitors equalised in the first minute of the second half. Parkin saves from Van der Laan, but is stranded as Foyle follows up to score. Port Vale, in fact, were to go on to take the lead for the first time. Rovers goalkeeper comes out, can't get to it before Van der Laan's brave header. There's the cross, out comes Parkin, Van der Laan's there first. The Potteries fans love that after their long journey. Van der Laan's not too pleased though, he's been tested for concussion. Okay, how many fingers can you see? All right, you're okay to carry on. Rovers carried on battling and gained a free kick from which Justin Skinner was to strike. Cross peels off, Skinner lets rip, and there it is in the back of the Port Vale net. See it again in slow motion, you'll see Carl Saunders in the Port Vale wall, a gap appears, and Skinner's drive blisters through. And Mark Grew cannot grow far enough to get that one. So, a delighted Skinner then, and Rovers relieved to take a point from a six-goal match. But to Derby 3. Well, Jeff. Well, Roger, basically, Justin Skinner had the ball, lost possession, and I wanted to get it into the Derby half of the pitch as quick as I could. But uh, I couldn't do it, so I thought, I'll get it back to Brian and let him do it. But unfortunately, the time it had gone in the net, we'd kicked off. It took a bit longer than I'd hoped. Um, occupational hazard, really. Um, very disappointing to lose the match on the strength of it. I could think of someone better than Bobby Davison to give the ball to, but uh, he's finished with some style, really, and uh, very disappointing. But these things happen in football, and you've got to stand up and be counted when you do make mistakes. What sort of a week has it been with your teammates? How have they taken it? Oh, marvellous. I mean, they accept that, you know, really it could be, could be anyone. I mean, tomorrow it could be someone else and uh, it's part and part of the game. Oh, he was upset and he uh, expressed his feelings coming off the pitch. But uh, to be fair to that man, he, he wrote me a letter and I received it at the training ground on Monday morning. And it shows that he cares about the club, which is something good to come out of it. Right, Mark, genuine fan. Yeah, right, that's nice, isn't it? That uh, the fan loses his head, has a go at Jeff, but then has the good sense to write him a nice letter. I think the fan was obviously caught up in his emotions because... Um, you know, ended up Bristol Rovers losing the game, but we've all done it. I mean, one of the best goals I ever scored, Roger, was for um, Norwich. Actually, when I was playing for Liverpool. I mean, six-yard box, never missed from there. My own goal, great goal it was, marvellous. How do managers take it? For instance, how would the legendary Bill Shankly have taken that Liverpudlian's effort over there, Mr Twentyman's pass back? Well, they probably wouldn't have spoke to him for at least two weeks, that's a certainty. But, um, you know, the, the problem with, with last week was the fact that Rovers were 2-1 up. 
and uh, they've conceded two goals in the last ten minutes, which is the goaling thing, not so much how they, how they actually conceded them, but the fact that they did concede them when they're in a winning position. How did your manager take it? Extremely well. I mean, Dennis, um, he said to me I'd played extremely well in the game and I didn't really deserve it to happen. And I thought it was big words in a very difficult situation. And the respect that you know, we I hold for Dennis was compounded in those few seconds. I know I sometimes have nightmares about my mistakes. Have you had any nightmares about this one? I haven't really, but that's probably because uh, the baby's been up most of the week and I haven't had very much sleep, to be honest, Rog. <laughs> that Dennis Rose a liar as well. Yeah. Said. <laughs> anyway, Jeffrey, look, now to lift your spirit, so let's bring you memories of how you occasionally enrich uh, all that steady defensive work at the back by helping Rovers score at the right end. Yeah, this was um, on, on off-the-cuff goal, really. We hadn't rehearsed it. Ian Alexander played a great ball forward to uh, Big Devon, who knocked it off his chest, and he just hit it on the volley. Instinct, really. And uh, you know, it was one of those m moments you'll cherish, and uh, it's nice to see it going in, cos, um, yeah, it was me who scored it, Rog, after all, yeah. Very enjoyed. Well, this was in one of our goal of the months, wasn't it? Cos good tackle by Holloway, who's no longer with him. And what's the timing of the run here from Sealy? Good first touch in the onion bag. That was a good result for Rovers, and it'd uh, be nice if we could get that down to Millwall tomorrow, where it's not quite as fearsome a place to go and play now as it used to be. Planning permission and raise, what is it, £20 million. The latter perhaps more difficult than the former. For over two months before today, their visitors were Cambridge United. Rovers were completely unruffled by their position in the second division, fourth from bottom, or their visitors, Cambridge, on top. From Rovers' first corner, Saunders challenged well, Pounder's powerful header looked to have gone straight in. But David Mayhew was the man doing the celebrating. A look at the replay shows how well Saunders did to win the ball against two defenders. And then as Pounder heads home, Mayhew gets the crucial deflection for his fourth goal in as many games. But Rovers, as they've done so often at home this season, then made an unforced error. Alexander's weak pass, Taylor's chase, a delightful back heel allowing Philpott to cross and Dublin to head home his 11th goal of the season. Rovers hit back straight away, crosses long pass, Devon White's aerial power, and though Reece can't get ahead to it, Saunders latches onto the ball, his cross met perfectly by Devon White, and Rovers were back in front. Saunders pace off the mark, the vital ingredient here, and then a lovely cross from him, and Devon White timing his run to score. But in the second half, though, it was to be a familiar story for Rovers. Celebrations cut short as they squandered their lead yet again. Dion Dublin's spectacular cross, finding Taylor unmarked. Cambridge gain a point, Rovers' fourth home draw in a row. And the thing about this, Roger, is the fact when the ball gets played in to Big Devon, Plays it out to Alexander, who's overlapping on the right, and it's the quality of the cross that makes this goal. One touch, and it's a great cross to the far post, and Saunders base has just got to stick his head on it. Good goal. Yeah. Goals. City had a strong wind in their favour, and Dave Rennie's wind-assisted drive after ten minutes gave them a spectacular lead. A superb example of using the elements to maximum advantage. Soon Wayne Allison had the chance to increase City's lead, but uh, after rounding goalkeeper Kelly, he hesitates, and the goalkeeper recovers. Well. Rovers began to attack well into the wind, and David Mayhew's half folly warned the City. Andy Leaning had to save sharply. Then shortly before half-time, Rovers scored in controversial circumstances. Watch now, does Big Devon White challenge fairly for the high ball, or does he foul Andy Leaning, the goalkeeper? The referee awarded a goal, said there was no foul, and I agree. Well, within a minute, Rovers were rubbing salt in the wound. City don't mark White in the box there. Tony Pounder makes them pay for it. Rovers fans who thought they were going in at half-time, a goal down, suddenly were celebrating a 2-1 lead. On the resumption, Rovers almost increased that lead. Tony Pounder's header is to come back off the goal frame. And Saunders' shot is to be very well saved on the line by Russell Osborne. Carl Saunders often stretching the City. Leaning had to stretch to keep him out. But now the City began to build good moves against the wind. And uh, Allison's header is only to be inches too high. 
City build again. May to Rennie, lovely pass. Substitute bench is released, a vital moment for City. But the winger misses the target. Next, suicide for City. No immediate danger in this situation, is there? But Ros Lodzman delays his pass. The goalkeeper loses the ball as if it's a piece of soap and the predatory Saunders helps himself. A two-goal lead and only ten minutes to go. Rovers believed they were there. With City getting one of those goals back through Junior Bent, uh, a narrow result in the end was to swing on that controversial first Rovers goal. There are those who say goalkeepers are overprotected, but that wasn't the case when you scored your first goal. No, um, and a lot of occasions the referee might have given a foul. Today he chose not to. Uh, so I make a habit of not criticising them when they uh, give things against me, so uh, I don't go overboard when he gives things for me. That was Dennis Roof and not Bob Constantine. Congratulations to both teams on a splendid match in those difficult conditions of wind and rain. Fratton Park, Steve Cross driving the ball into his own net. Second half and Portsmouth made sure of the points when Chris Burns inflicted on Brian Parkin the next worst thing to an own goal that footballers hate, having the ball put through their legs. Will the real Rovers please stand up at Newcastle tomorrow? Now, Swindon... They began their new year very untidily, failing to gather their own goalkeeper's kick. And then Steve Yates fails with a vital challenge which lets David Oldfield in. And then his shot is pretty near a goalkeeper to get into the net, isn't it? But Rovers have always got a chance when Carl Saunders is in their side. Once again, it was his opportunism in tight spaces that scored a difficult goal and rescued a precious point. At least Rovers didn't lose whilst others about them in the table were. Dennis Rowe from the goals against Bristol City the other week in the derby. Sean is doing ever so well here. And this looks an awful ball, doesn't it, from Cross? But for my money, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that challenge because uh, the goalkeeper didn't have the ball in his hand. Yeah, yeah. I made it a good goal. Well, Devon again here. My mate Devon involved in the build-up. Found his good early strike, giving the keeper no chance. And the third goal that Rover scored. You know, this is the first time I've seen this, and I can't believe it. I honestly thought we were in Ireland or somewhere. I just can't believe this goal. I mean, Saunders, full credit to him for his perseverance, but. Uh, not too happy with Bristol City defending there. That's right. But we've got we'll see. Now, Winger Pounder was asked before this match by coach Rofe to look harder for goals. And in that local derby he did, tried a first-time shot. It worked for him for only his second score of the season. White, who is currently Bristol Rovers' leading goal scorer. Carl Saunders makes the opening and the big fella now shows nice skill as he takes the ball through and finds a calm, accurate finish. Nice one, Devon. So, recapping for you then. Tonight, the Merseysiders will be Rovers' opponents in the next round of the Cup. And Rovers say they're determined the game will be played at Twerton Park, which can hold just 9,500 supporters. It could mean a mass descent of Liverpool fans. And tomorrow, police will meet Rovers' management to discuss how the game will be controlled. It's one of the smaller stadiums that mighty Liverpool will have played on and they'll be surrounded by a crowd that could fit into Anfield four times over. The Rovers fans know full well the dimensions of the cup tie looming up. A single player from Liverpool is worth more than the Rovers' entire team and the ground put together. Far from considering playing the tie at a bigger ground to bring in more money, Rovers' chairman wants to remain loyal to the faithful fans. We could, of course, move somewhere else and uh enjoy greater gate receipts perhaps but we want to hold it at Twerton Park we think it's only fair to our fans and supporters the club will be meeting the police tomorrow and are likely to announce the special arrangements for the all-ticket match on Wednesday the club captain Liverpool born Jeff Twentyman who broke an ankle in yesterday's FA Cup game against Plymouth will miss the match today he warned of an invasion of supporters from Merseyside Liverpool fans are fanatics and regardless of whether they're allocated 900 or 1,000 tickets, they'll come down in their droves. And, you know, we all know the disaster at Hillsborough and that, that happened, but they'll still come down. And um, they'll just wait in the car park and listen to the roars. That's how fanatical they are. So hopefully, you know, there won't be too many major problems. At this tiny ground, the army of travelling fans from the COP will be limited to just 950 tickets. They'll be kept in this one small fenced-in area. But the very basic facilities at what is essentially a non-league ground will be more of a shock to the Liverpool players and officials who are more used to the grandeur and luxury at Anfield. 
The dressing room for the visiting team certainly has no frills. A black painted bench, a row of clothes hooks and a shower. It could be a cultural shock for the stars from Merseyside who are favourites to win the FA Cup. Oh, they're going to have a bit of a shock when they come to see our dressing rooms, the pitch and the stands and everything. And it's going to take them a, a good while to settle in. Hopefully we can do something before they can get to settle in. The news of the likely clash with Britain's most successful team for two decades has brought an avalanche of inquiries about tickets, which are yet to be printed. I've heard all sorts of different stories and um, how these have been supported them since in the year dot, and they don't know how much it is to get in. Yeah, the usual, the usual stories. But um, I'm hoping that the true fans, the ones that go regularly, will get the tickets first. Tonight, the fans are hoping Liverpool can push aside the challenge of Crew, which will clear the way for a cup trail to Twerton Park. They believe the cauldron-like atmosphere of their shared ground could just intimidate the giants of football. To drop three of decision about the future of caretaker manager Dennis Rove finally seems likely. The Rovers board have refused to be rushed into making a decision about the vacant manager's post, but now say there'll be a special meeting on Wednesday to settle the matter. Well, that's the draw for the fourth round of the Cup. Rovers with a home tie, Swindon play Coventry or Cambridge, and City, if they can overcome Wimbledon, will play Leicester. Anything had to be better than Rovers' last performance, but few expected five goals. In Alexander with the first after 38 minutes. Manager Dennis Roth had made radical changes, including dropping striker Devon White. The shake-up seemed to be working when Saunders got the second just before half-time. Then in the second half, helped by a poor Plymouth display, Rovers took control. Their third goal from a beautifully timed cross from Reese, Browning, Stewart or Saunders could have scored. Then number four and Saunders hat trick. Reese again puts it through and Saunders, despite the attention of three Plymouth defenders, squeezes it home. The last was perhaps the best. Pounder, who had come on as a substitute, raced down his home territory on the left, a 1-2 with Marcus Stewart to offer it on a plate to Saunders to set up what could be the biggest game in the club's recent history. I've always, as a player and a coach, found it a very, very difficult game whenever you play Liverpool. But it has the effect of, I think, uh, raising your own supporters and raising your own players. And it'll be a terrific test for the, the 11 that go out there against them. A supportive group collected the cup tickets they're entitled to. 7,500 of the 9.4 go to those groups. Any tickets left over after Liverpool's share and other official requirements will go on sale to the general public. That'll be on Monday. Meanwhile, on Saturday, Rovers' team concentrated on keeping away from the relegation zone and the Marcus Stewart goal beat Tranmere. Another example of a homegrown Rovers striker making good. So let's say when the ticket should have gone on sale, but the police had persuaded Rovers officials to open the ticket office seven hours early when there were more fans, just over 500, than there were available tickets. Rovers now ask those without not to turn up on the day. Well, Bristol Rovers players could hardly have had a worse preparation for the big match. They were only kept in Saturday's league game at Ipswich by the excellence of Brian Parkin's goalkeeping. Manager Dennis Rofe, though, refused to use the cup match as an excuse for his side's poor showing. The team made painfully aware that for all the chance of cup glory, second division survival is all important. Just as, though, as when it looked as though they were going to ride their luck, defeat at Ipswich, the decisive goal coming from Simon Milton, and that left Rovers just one point away from the automatic relegation places. Well, Bristol's... Battle. So it's 4.45 on Saturday. Here are today's football results. Bristol Rovers. Two. Liverpool. Two. Now settle for a draw. <laughs> one certainty... Rovers players are preparing this week for the biggest game of their careers. Some of the best seats for Saturday's big match couldn't be bought in any ticket office. For the ringside position in the aptly named Freeview Road, you'd have to try an estate agent. But right now, owners here wouldn't part with their houses for love or money. Though there's been a stream of hopefuls with cash in hand trying to buy their way into upstairs rooms for the game. We have had people knocking on the door. We had one chap yesterday um, 
came down and said that uh, he heard that people were letting people come in for so much. And uh, I said, I'm afraid uh, you're going to be disappointed because everybody down here has got their friends and relatives coming and all seats are taken. With nine members of his own family and two small rooms, it's going to be quite a squeeze. But for Dave and his neighbours on Saturday, this will be the best view in the country. Come to think of it, if I offered you, offered you £100, would you squeeze me into your bedroom? Nope, not at all. 500 No, there's just not the room. Of course, I wasn't serious, but if I had been, the answer would have been just the same. As Oldham discovered last weekend, Liverpool are getting their away day game together, and local product there, Steve McManaman, scored their first goal at Boundary Park. Now, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Well, soon it was Dean Saunders' 16th goal of the season, underlining the danger to Rovers of this £2.9 million pound striker. That's the one they'll have to stop on Tuesday or Wednesday week. And then it was Liverpool's latest million and a half pound signing, Michael Thomas, wooed away from the Arsenal, showing that he can score goals as well as graft in midfield. That's another red shirt the Rovers will have to keep an eye on. Well, Jeff, when this match is played, will a slightly frosty night be of great help to Rovers? Well, it probably will, because it'll take away the little bit of skill factor Liverpool have got, or the considerable skill factor, and it'll be more of a levelling thing, but uh, I'm definitely pleased they haven't uh, proceeded with the game, and it's nice to see Roger Milford's got a decision right at last in calling the game off. So All right, Jeff, more from you later. Well, as our Mark here found out when he visited his old club this week, Liverpool are really looking forward to their West Country trip. After their Rumbelows Cup defeat against Peterborough, Liverpool could have reason to be worried about the trip to Twerton. But that's not the case. Now looking at, at the Cup tie at Rovers, um, obviously you know Twerton Park because you, you had a season there, didn't you? Yeah, um, under different circumstances I think. Uh, we were playing on the gates of two and a half thousand. Uh, they're getting better gates now and they did win the championship, so it was a lot different then. And are there still players who are playing for the current team that, that were there when you were there? Yeah, I think in the team would be Ian Alexander. Um, Steve Yates was there, uh, Andy Reese as well, so, you know. So fair few. smuttering. And do yeah. you keep in touch with them still? Yeah, I try to keep in touch as much as I can, but obviously not um, enough really to stay that good friends with them, but I do go down from time to time, but haven't had a chance lately. As, as the rest of the team at Liverpool ask you exactly what Twerton Park's like, because they must have heard all the stories, all the horror stories, as it were. Yeah, I think they're all looking forward to it, you know, they've, uh, they've all invited their families down there to come and have a look at it, so. And goalkeeper Bruce Grabler has family living in the Chew Valley. They were all going to come to the game. And what have you heard about Bath? What have you heard about uh, where Bristol Rovers play? Well, Nicky Tanner's actually just given us a little bit of insight into Twerton Park as it is. Could you understand what he was saying? Yes, because of my parent, um, father and mother-in-law living down there. Um, but he says it's going to be a bit of a culture shock to all these you know, expensive players and uh, they must just take it in their stride. We're not taking anything for granted. We, we played against the, our old team, Peterborough, and um, you know we really struggled. We looked like uh, we hadn't played before, so we've just got to make sure it never happens again. Um, we, we've done a business against Crew, um, and if we give them any sort of a sniff, I think um, we'll find it another difficult game. Mark, how do you read the effect of this postponement on the likely outcome of this match? I don't think uh, the postponement will have that much. Of a result on the outcome. I think the thing is, Roger, the FA Cup is that it's all about the day, it's about the build-up, and with it being night, a uh, night game, it takes some of the edge off it somewhat. I'm sure Jeff will agree with me when, you know, you look forward to the Saturday, but, you know, the Rovers fans have looked forward for weeks to this Saturday, and now they've got this disappointment, and the night time won't quite be the same. What are the lights like at Twerton? Will Liverpool fancy them? Oh, the lights are fine, Roger, no problem at all with them. But will they, can you put Liverpool's lights out, do you think? Yeah. Everything's possible. Hey. I mean, I think I agree with Mark, I mean, it's going to help Liverpool out there. The euphoria of the build-up isn't going to take place tomorrow and it'll probably help them, but, you know, I fancy our lads to get a good result. Rovers had the better of the chances. Ian Alexander's dipping volley here only narrowly over the bar. But there was to be no repeat of last month's 5-0 thrashing in the cup. Tony Pounder again came close with a long-range effort. There was really nothing to frighten Liverpool on Wednesday. control Jeep in an inspired bid to pep up the proceedings. As it turned out, this was the near the back of the net all afternoon. And an afternoon of misery was completed by the sending off of Argyle defender Spearing for a challenge on Alexander. 
Alexander should be OK for Wednesday's visit by Liverpool, but on this showing, the mighty Reds have nothing to fear. Well, Swindon missed a golden... Here's David Bassmore. Well, Chris, the match has just finished. The final score, Bristol Rovers won, Liverpool won. It was probably Rovers' best performance of the season. They matched Liverpool until, after 37 minutes, Dean Saunders' shot hit the post. The ball then rebounded off the Bristol Rovers goalkeeper, Brian Parkin, and rolled gently into the net. But in the second half, in a move Liverpool would have been proud of, Carl Saunders equalised, and Rovers have forced a replay at Anfield. David Passmore, BBC News West at Twerton Park. But they face second division Bristol Rovers. <laughs> to play Ipswich away. John Motson commentating this time. There may be only nine and a half thousand lucky ticket holders inside Twerton Park, but nowhere on the road to Wembley this season will you find greater fervour for a football occasion. They could have sold three times the number of tickets for a tie that's captured the imagination of the West Country. And if Bristol Rovers don't have their own ground, they do have their pride and money in the bank. Two reasons why they turned down the opportunity to switch this tie to Anfield. The local hero is 27 years old Carl Saunders, who scored four times against Plymouth in the third round. So there's an obvious comparison tonight with his namesake, Dean Saunders, who earlier this season scored four times in a match for Liverpool. And his partner tonight will be Steve McManaman, because Ronnie Rosenthal is dropped to substitute, and Mike Marsh starts at number four. Michael Thomas and Steve Nicholl have joined the injury list, so those who incurred the wrath of Graham Souness on Saturday have a chance to make amends, including number six, Nicky Tanner, a former Bristol Rovers player. Now here are the modern Rovers hoping to make a name for themselves. They've climbed to a respectable 15th in the second division and a new manager, Dennis Rofe. He's without his injured skipper, Jeff Twentyman, but number nine, Devon White, has recently been restored as partner to Carl Saunders. Never mind, this is Anfield. This is Twerton Park. In keeping with tradition, Bristol Rovers in blue and white quartered shirts and surely only the lovable old FA Cup could have mixed a cocktail quite like this. Liverpool, one of the most famous teams in the world, having to put their reputation on the line in one of the smallest areas in the country. On by Mehu. That's Devon White. Good control. Saunders. That was Tanner's intervention. Now Mulby. In goes Reese. Reese again. It's Reese for Bristol Rovers. Well, Robert Robillard not pleased with the defence, but doubtless relieved that the shot went straight at him from Andy Reese. That was good play by the central midfield man of Bristol Rovers. He really followed the attack through and found himself with a shooting chance. Jan Morby a bit half-hearted, really. Mark Wright's header hit Reese, came back to him for the volley. Forward by Morby. This is Saunders. Free kick given. Saunders was fouled. Houghton tried to take it quickly, but not from there, surely. Colby takes the kick, there's McManaman, this is Mike Marsh. Both sides here taking the opportunity to get forward quickly and make openings. Oh, some measured play by the Danish international for Liverpool. Some tigerish tackling by Bristol Rovers, eventually a little bit too much so. Free kick to Liverpool. Header was by Alexander, then Clark, Rob Jones, Marsh. Tanner's in there, this is Dean Saunders for the volley, offside, flags up. Wouldn't have mattered because as Saunders shot, 
McManaman, I believe, ran into an offside position. It was initially dangerous here. It was Yates who headed it out, but as Saunders shoots, there's the Liverpool player on the six-yard line. So half an hour gone at Twerton Park. No score. This is White. Carl Saunders. Now, can he hold them off? He does, and Grobola down to his left. Well, Carl Saunders ran at the defence here, and it was Nicky Tanner who he held off. But again, the shot not quite far enough away from the goalkeeper for a Bristol point of view. McManaman. Jones. it was Yates who put it behind Steve Yates who's the captain and central defender 100 to 1 outsider to score the first goal tonight he's never scored for Bristol Rovers that's not what he's thinking about at the moment as Marsh takes the corner for Liverpool and that's Mark Wright and there's Dean Saunders and it's in it's over the line and in Dean Saunders swivelled, got his shot in, and Brian Parkin got to it too late. It looked as though he might keep it out, the Birkenhead-born keeper. But the team he used to support have got the better of him here. It's a header by Mark Wright. A little swivel against Yates by Dean Saunders, and that hits the post. Oh, it's gone in off the keeper, really. Technically, you could say it was an own goal by Brian Parkin, although I suspect Saunders will claim it. And the shot! So close. It was Mihu. And you've got to give Bristol Rovers full marks here for the way they've bounced back from the goal. David Mihu, a cracking volley as he fell. Reese, good early ball, but uh, why? Oh, it's Mihu, is it? Oh, and not given. David Burrows on Mihu, and they screamed for a penalty, but the referee had a look and said no. Brian Hill shook his head. What did you think? A bad back pass to start with. David Burrows comes in behind him. Mihu looked round and the referee shook his head. That's a good piece of holding up play by White. Forward by Pounder. Away by Mark Wright. White again. You just feel that if Bristol Rovers had got hold of one or two of their shots a bit better, they might well have uh, registered at least one goal by now. Skinner. Here's Carl Saunders. Reese looks for Pounder. Still Tony Pounder. Good run. Nicely chipped in. Oh, and how did Liverpool survive that? Mihu can't believe that he didn't tuck that away. And Grobelar is shaking his head. Knows it was a lucky escape for the first division side. Mihu was so close. And still. Reese. Pounder goes again. Good name for him, actually. He certainly pounds out the yards down this left wing. His cross. Former Weymouth player, the number 11. This is Skinner. Got past Tanner. Carl Saunders. Mihu! Whether it's Grobelar's expert positioning, I don't know, but they just seem to have placed their shots within his range, they haven't hit one right in the corner yet, Mihu there, benefiting from good approach play by Carl Saunders, but once again, steering it right in the direction of the keeper. And there's a few words being exchanged over there, in front of the team benches. And the Rovers fans chant, we're going to score in a minute. They've come close, Carl Saunders. Mihu again. Carl Saunders! Yes! 
He's done it. Robert, I can't believe it. The fans can, and certainly Carl Saunders will. Anything Dean Saunders can do, his namesake can equal. Mihu called it back. What a good side foot finish. That was composure in the penalty area from the striker who got four in round three, but he'll have enjoyed that one more. It's 1-1. One, one. And what a cup tie we have now at Twerton Park. And what a good build-up on the right by Mihu, who's played so well. This is Mulby. Burrows. McManaman. Danger here. Oh, Parkin in the right place. Carl Saunders, who's played in the first division for Stoke, scores there his 12th goal of the season, and what an important one it could prove to be. Walters. And he takes the inward route this time. Expression suggests that was very close. There wasn't much cover on there in the Bristol Rovers defence. He came inside Alexander. There were Liverpool players up with him, but Walters only had his eye on the goal. It wasn't as close as he made it look. Mulby, Burrows, Saunders. And held on well there. Marsh with the header. Parkins getting a little excited, he thought there was a foul over on the far side on Alexander. But I think you'll see what happened here, it is Saunders, oh look at the elbow. Now that's bad, and it wasn't seen. Now there's so much talk about elbows in football at the moment, no wonder Alexander reacted like that. And Dean Saunders is a lucky man that that wasn't apparently seen by a referee or linesman. Is there yet time for Bristol Rovers to produce the storybook finish? It's a free kick. Billy Clark is making his way forward. He's joined Carl Saunders and White in the thick of it there. Alexander is foxing them at the moment. Played forward by Rees, Carl Saunders, Rob Jones came in behind him, and it's safe for Liverpool. Marsh, Houghton. Cross, Jones. Mulvey. Marsh. Pounder. They're trying to stay onside, no they haven't. It was a very close decision and it went against David Mehew. We are entering stoppage time in this FA Cup fourth round tie at Twerton Park Buff. And it's 1-1 between Bristol Rovers of the second division and Liverpool of the first. And what a stimulating, enthralling encounter that was. And Bristol Rovers' decision to play the match at Twerton Park has a built-in bonus, not just because Carl Saunders scored the equaliser to level the Dean Saunders effort via Parkin in the first half, but because the fans have seen it first-hand here and the tie goes back to Anfield next Tuesday where Bristol Rovers will get a payday that they thoroughly deserve. What a great night they've had here and how well their team responded as they salute their supporters. A great credit, Carl Saunders and his men, to Dennis Rowe and Bristol Rovers. It was a match that did justice to the spirit of the FA Cup. Dennis, what's your reaction to that performance and that result? Well, the last thing I said to the team when they left the dressing room was, uh, when you go home tonight, I'd like the people of Bristol to be proud of you. And I think they've done that for me.
Um, I'm disappointed not to have won, obviously, because I like to win every game I play. But I've nothing but praise for my team, and I think they can walk out in the streets of uh, Bath and Bristol tonight with their heads held high. Bath and Bristol, they're walking around tonight. Um, I suppose you'd fancy Liverpool strongly now? Yeah, certainly. It was always going to be a, a difficult tie for Liverpool going to Bristol Rovers, and I, they'll probably be happy with the draw and take them back to Anfield. Mm. Bristol Rovers certainly had their moments, but I, I didn't really think there was that much in it. I think a draw was probably the right result. OK, Alan, thank you. Well, four other tyres were played tonight, and Ray Stubbs has the goal. It's bad for Liverpool at Twerton Park. Carl Saunders equalised in the 59th minute for second division Bristol Rovers, after his Liverpool namesake scored the opener. The rematch is next Tuesday at Anfield. For a night of FA Cup glory against mighty Liverpool, the second division side held Liverpool to a one-all draw at Twerton Park, will now go to Anfield next Tuesday for the replay. For Rovers, it'll mean another big payday. These were the lucky ones, an army of fans ready for the West's biggest cup tie in decades. Packed to capacity, it was carnival time at Twerton Park. Very soon, Rovers would come face to face with mighty Liverpool. But those without tickets weren't going to miss out. They climbed on walls and clambered on roofs just for a glimpse. It was open house, for a small fee, of course. Some put up makeshift scaffolding on their lawns. This was a sporting garden party with a grandstand view. Every vantage point in every house around Twerton Park was jam-packed, all straining for a look. It was billed as Saunders versus Saunders, and that's the way it turned out. Liverpool's version giving the visitors the lead. And just before half-time, the moment they'll be talking about all the way to the replay at Anfield. Was David Mayhew fouled as he shaped up to shoot? The man that counts didn't think so. It's fair to say he was in a minority. But Rovers Saunders had the last word. A clinical finish to give them another go on Merseyside. Carl Saunders! Yes! He's done it! Robert Lark can't believe it. The fans can. And as he was chaired off, the faithful had already begun to debate what could have been. What did you think of the game? Fantastic. I'm almost hoarse, sorry, I can hardly talk, but brilliant. More than I expected. Uh, I thought we'd beat them 1-0, actually. Like. Disappointed? Not, Not really, like. we'll, beat, we'll beat them out there. Like. It's really great against a team like Liverpool. We've done brilliant, haven't we? It's brilliant. brilliant. It was a night well worth celebrating about, with just a tinge of, if only, about it. In a sense, we were a bit disappointed we didn't win because we thought we deserved to win. We'd we done everything we was asked of. And, um, you know, we applied ourselves, right? And we ended up with a draw, which was a superb result for the boys. But at the end of the day, we could have turned out with a win. We could have got away with a win. I think we deserved to win. I was proud of them. Uh, I asked them before the game, when I came off the pitch, that the people of Bristol could be proud of their performance tonight. And I'm sure everybody's gone away thinking that the team really had a go for them. Liverpool went away knowing they came very close to being dumped out of the cup. Their fans just glad for a second chance. So what do you think of Twerton Park? It's all right. Yeah. How does it compare to Anfield? It's a bit smaller. And they left Bath giving the West a clear indication of what they expect next week's result to be. Well, as we've heard, the replay is next Tuesday at Anfield. Rovers fans have been allocated 5,300 tickets and season ticket holders can buy tickets for the match. That's up until Saturday. Everyone else can buy tickets at Twerton Park on Sunday, but only if they've got a ticket stub from last night's match and another from Saturday's match against Sunderland. It's arrived more in hope than real expectation that their team could pull off a serious cup upset. The police had more officers on duty than ever before, and for the first time they used a helicopter to send television pictures of the crowds direct to their control room. More than 9,000 fans packed the tiny Twerton Park Stadium, but as the teams ran on, it sounded as if the crowd could have been double that. The match was, of course, a sellout, but many more fans watched from outside the ground. Rovers held Liverpool for the first half hour, creating just as many chances. Carl Saunders here, sending Bruce Grobelaar diving to his left. 
but after 37 minutes, Dean Saunders holds off Steve Yates and gets in his shot. Dean Saunders, and it's in. It's over the line and in. The ball comes off the post, hits Brian Parkin, and gently rolls over the line. But Rovers' enthusiasm didn't flag, and few in the ground didn't shout for a penalty three minutes from half time. And not given. David Burrows on Mayhew, and they. Mayhew was just about to shoot when David Burrows' challenge comes in. In the second half, Rovers continued to show determination and considerable skill in holding Liverpool before showing them the way. Mayhew again causing Grobelar problems. The equaliser came after an excellent move by Mayhew, beating men before laying the ball back for Rovers' Carl Saunders to score. Mayhew again. Carl Saunders! Yes! He's done it! Grobelar can't believe it. The fans can. Mayhew does some excellent work down the right and Saunders shoots well. Rovers could even have had a winner, but in the end had to be content with the replay at Anfield. Rovers were delighted. The recriminations in the Liverpool dressing room had begun. I'd like to think that it's a, it's a night that uh, the supporters and people of Bristol will savour for many, many years to come. Was it one of your best performances of the season? I think it has to be ranked as that, really. Um, I'm obviously disappointed a little bit that we didn't win the game because I'd set out to win every game we play. Um, but at the end, we go back to Anfield, we're not out the FA Cup yet, we're still in and we go up there with a great deal of optimism. Replay tickets are already on sale to season ticket holders and go on general sale on Sunday. But supporters must have ticket stubs, both from last night's game and Saturday's game against Sunderland. David Passmore on a great night. The Rovers and Liverpool went on sale at Twerton Park today. Nearly all the tickets for the match at Anfield have been sold. Fans had to produce ticket stubs from both the first match against Liverpool last week and yesterday's match against Sunderland. Roger Malone was there to see them off. The Rovers were travelling this evening with the relaxed air of players knowing the football world expects them to lose at the home of Britain's most famous club of the modern era tomorrow night. But though he knows the task is going to be difficult, Rovers manager can see a way of winning through. It will be tough, but there's, I would say there's possibly slightly more pressure on Liverpool now. They're at home, they're expected to win even more. No pressure on these boys and this coach at all. Um, they know the job in hand. They've, they've had experience, they've been to Wembley. They've been in a playoff situation in the league, so they've, they're used to tough games. So uh, I'm confident that they can handle themselves on the night. There is a sign at Anfield, isn't there, as you walk on the pitch, which you're a member of the player. This is Anfield. It's supposed to strike uh, terror into the hearts of those who see it for the first time. Well, it, I don't know. I would think it would inspire these boys and about strike terror into there. They'll, they'll know long before that sign where they are. Wish you well, sir, and uh, have a good trip. Thank you. We need Great. it. Ladbrokes are offering 9-1 to one against the Rovers. The transfer fee cost of their entire team is only a tenth of the cost of Liverpool's Dean Saunders. Yet Rovers' 5,000 travelling fans care nothing for all that. They know that in a match of two sides, both have a chance. Rovers' error also set up the opposition for the first goal at Twerton Park. Johnny Byrne making a good job of his chance to give Sunderland the lead. Carl Saunders' penalty after a handball incident brought Rovers level. And then Saunders, the sharp finishing hero against Liverpool in the Cup, kept in the groove for tomorrow's replay with a goal that keeps Rovers climbing away from that relegation zone. And so to tomorrow's night's then second crack at Liverpool for those... It's John Motson. From the Sabutio-style surroundings of Twerton Park, this tie has moved to the more stylish setting of Anfield, which makes it a significant night for the Bristol Rovers goalkeeper, Brian Parkin, who was born at nearby Birkenhead and supported Liverpool as a boy. He's part of a Rovers team unchanged from the first game. Their scorer then, number 10, Carl Saunders, got two more against Sunderland on Saturday, and number four, Steve Yates, the Rovers' captain, was rested from that match because after tonight, he goes into hospital for a groin operation. Well, injuries are something that Liverpool have suffered on an unprecedented scale this season. But Steve Nicholl is back at number four. He'll start alongside Mark Wright. Number nine, Ronnie Rosenthal, will play up front with Dean Saunders. 
And on the substitutes bench, after three months out of first team action, is Ian Rush. And if he gets on, he'll hope to get a bit nearer Dennis Law's all-time FA Cup scoring record. Law managed 41 goals in this competition. Rush currently has 37. And the 7,000 fans who follow Bristol Rovers from the West Country to Merseyside know that history is against them here. It's 23 years since Liverpool lost an FA Cup replay at Anfield. And since then, only Brighton in 1983 have put them out of the FA Cup on this ground. So it's a tall order for second division Bristol Rovers. But they're determined to enjoy the night come what may. Here's David Burrows, number three for Liverpool. McManaman playing wide on the left. And uh, Carl Saunders, Steve Nicholl. There's Dean Saunders. Rob Jones starts to make his way forward from uh, right back. Dean Saunders cross. That's Marsh. And here's Rosenthal. And that's Houghton. Oh, I think uh, it was supposed to be set up by McManaman for Burrows there, but they didn't read each other. Bristol Rovers say they could have uh, got rid of about 25,000 tickets had they uh, been made available to them. I think that might be a bit optimistic, but certainly uh, not everybody that wanted to travel could do so. And they forced a corner in front of the 7,000 who are here. Five minutes gone. And Liverpool with some defending to do here. Clark has gone up to the near post. Mihu is on the line. Devon White to come in from the penalty spot. There's White. Ooh, and Grobelaar was in the right place as he was so often last week. Everything that Bristol Rovers struck seemed to go straight to him at uh, Twerton Park. And here's another example as uh, Rees curls the corner in. Big Devon White gets up and it may have come off Mark Wright. Skinner, touch back to him by uh, White, not a bad effort either, got a touch on it, so it's going to be a corner, number six, Justin Skinner, Bristol Rovers record buy, would you believe, at just £130,000, and here he goes inside Mark Wright, and it's a corner to Rovers. Clark comes near post, White. And Liverpool breaking, there are players right and left here. The player on the left is David Burrows, Alexander is there for Rovers. Only as far as Ronnie Rosenthal. And the ball in by Burrows, cleared by Reese. Every Bristol Rovers touch getting a loud cheer at the moment from their supporters and there's a foul by Mike Marsh on Justin Skinner. Here's Rosenthal being marked by Yates there. And Ray Houghton. It will depend on him tonight in midfield for Liverpool without the more experienced uh, partner in Moby. He's got 18-year-old uh, Jamie Redknapp there on the ball, number 10. And Marsh, of course, in that area as well. Here's Burrows. Here's Redknapp. And now it's Houghton. And Saunders, defender slipped, recovered. Houghton again. McManaman in a great position here. The cross, he wasn't quite tall enough to reach it, even with the jump. Still McManaman. And after 10 minutes, McManaman who thought his better chance, no doubt, was when he was unmarked in the penalty area, but uh, he couldn't reach that one. When he did come inside Alexander, he tested Brian Parkin. Here's Reese to Pounder. 
Mihu. Pounder again. That's right. It was nearly to Mihu. It's to Carl Saunders, in fact. Good volley. Oh, yes. What a start for second division Bristol Rovers. And it's Carl Saunders again. And their supporters thrilled to bits. What a strike. Graham Souness can only reflect on that. This is a smashing finish. Waiting for the ball to bounce. Right foot volley. Robillard got his hands to it, perhaps. But it was right up in the top locker. And Carl Saunders, who equalised last week, gives Bristol Rovers the lead this week. With his 15th goal of the season. And he won't strike a sweeter one, surely. 18 minutes gone. And the ground reverberating with the celebrations of the blue and white bedecked supporters of Bristol Rovers. They're, they just can't believe it. And what a ground to score a goal like that. One or two of the Rovers lads were calling this, as far as they were concerned, the game of a lifetime. I would imagine that uh, just at this very moment, Carl Saunders might think he scored the goal of a lifetime. But here's Dean Saunders at the other end. And that's not a bad effort either. And Parkin comes to the feet of Houghton. Dean Saunders trying to <laughs> match his namesake. Not quite. They've been looking forward to this match so much, these Rovers lads. And they're enjoying it even more now, and so are their fans. Clark away from Rosenthal. Rovers, of course, without their injured uh, centre-back and captain Jeff Twentyman, who's uh, broken his ankle. He's here tonight on the, uh, at the ground where his father used to play for Liverpool. And he'll be thrilled with the way his team have started. There's no doubt about that. Here's Jones for Liverpool. And the second challenge looked like a trip. So Liverpool take it quickly. This is Jamie Redknapp. McManaman comes in, out to Marsh. Oh, it's Burrows. And the referee goes to his notebook. And David Burrows, whose bookings now are really mounting up, I think he's probably facing suspension. That's something like nine bookings this season and the victim of that uh, impetuous challenge was the goal scorer so it's a yellow card for the Liverpool number three and this was why Carl Saunders in possession and that's wild it's grim at the moment from the Liverpool point of view and I would imagine Graham Souness will have some pretty stiff words to say at half-time if it continues this way. And now it's Marsh. Rosenthal, oh, Saunders. It's all a little bit tip-tap, but this is McManaman now. And he's forced the corner. And that's Liverpool's first corner after 40 minutes play. Now, what can they make of it? Mark Wright taking up a far side position. Dean Saunders will take it. And there is Wright. Oh, and hooked away by Alexander, I think, from nearly on the line, the right back. It was number two, Mark Wright's header, but I think you'll find this is Ian Alexander, the uh, Scotsman at right back who makes the clearance because Wright got a header in which was wide of parking. Yes, that's a good clearance. That's what they're on the post for. Clark. It's, uh... Rosenthal setting up Redknapp, and now it's Burrows and McManaman. They've got to get some width and try and get behind them because they're not getting through them. That's wide on the right now to Jones. 
red match header but not going close enough for Liverpool Rob Jones named in the England squad yesterday by Graham Taylor gets the cross in here and it's uh, Redknapp who didn't get power or direction there well so many first division teams have been usurped in the FA Cup so far and here are Liverpool almost unbelievably one down at home to Carl Saunders magnificent volley a goal that he'll remember for the rest of his career and it's uh, given Bristol Rovers great heart and posed for Graham Souness and Liverpool a situation which they could hardly have expected at half-time. Well, two of Ian Rush's 37 FA Cup goals came as a substitute in the final itself against Everton in 1989. What would Liverpool give, I wonder, for a couple now? He's on in place of Ronnie Rosenthal for the start of the second half. And what Liverpool would also like is a bit more noise from the cop, I suspect. They were very quiet in the first half. Liverpool now attacking that end. And they need the fans to lift them. Steve Cross has uh, done a decent job at left back. Versatile player. Reese Pounder that's uh, Dean Saunders where well, it was Bristol Rovers beaten only once in six games since Dennis Rove became the manager officially and Liverpool beaten only once in 14 and Rush gets Dean Saunders coming in behind him and Rush again he's got Burrows out left and it's come back to Redknapp well Brian Park in the goalkeeper who didn't have to worry about that shot from Jamie Redknapp has been looking forward to this moment playing in front of the cop where he used to stand and watch Liverpool play but he's got a busy three quarters of an hour ahead of him I would, I would say Dean Saunders to Ray Houghton Burrows header out by Alexander Burrows again three waiting for a cross pull back though it's Houghton. Oh, deflection corner. Well, Houghton has engineered a goal or two from those positions this season. You'll see here that his shot clips a Bristol Rovers player, and that sends it header really wide of the goal. Houghton coming in with Mihu, and it's going to be retrieved by Redknapp. Four waiting in a line for Liverpool. Header out was by Devon White. This is McManaman. Now he's opened up a little bit here. McManaman shot! Oh, didn't he open them up? Beautifully struck. And the cop now voiced their relief. And Steve McManaman hits a goal that in its way was every bit as good as Carl Saunders. He comes across Reese, left foot, going away from the keeper, right in the corner. It was a beauty by McManaman, and it's one all. He scored in the third round at Crewe, but he gets one here that's far more important on the night. It's put Liverpool back in business in this FA Cup replay. Steve McManaman, whose birthday it is today, 20 years old, what better way to celebrate? He's given them a present.
now the test is of Bristol Rovers character and endurance that's Rush maybe just the presence of Rush up there has uh, galvanised Liverpool a bit some players have that effect even when they're not actually involved in uh, the goal itself That's his header. McManaman again. And the switch to the right of McManaman has worked wonders. Here's Redknapp. Burrows. Cross. Steve Nichol. That should restore some order to the Liverpool style of play. Mark Wright, McManaman. Round the back of them. Goodness me, off Alexander in the end. But McManaman now on the other wing, playing now at the start of the second half on the right, has suddenly become a danger to Rovers. And Saunders and pull back Saunders yes he's got it no he hasn't oh what a chance it was always on for Dean Saunders here from the moment Houghton made the run McManaman didn't make it and it looked as though it was in from uh, our side of the ground but it went the wrong side of the post well we have a good cup tie on our hands now Came off Clark, Redknapp following up. This is McManaman. Still McManaman. Brilliantly done by McManaman. And away as Ian Rush waited to pounce. It was Yates, I think, that got the ball out. It was a great run by McManaman. Here's Jones. Well, now Bristol Rovers really know they're at Anfield. They've got their backs to the cop and Liverpool are swarming down upon them. Here's Rush. Pushing and shoving. This is McManaman. Saunders waiting, Rush waiting. There's Rush, he took it away from Burrows who was coming in behind him. Couldn't have heard the shout if there was one. Burrows was at full pelt coming in for the header. But Rovers have made a presence of the ball back to uh, Liverpool here. And vice versa. Oh, and it's Dean Saunders. Missed it. Would you believe it? Boothroyd, the substitute, will be so relieved. Because there were three bad passes in quick succession there. And Dennis Rhodes' team nearly committed Harry Carey in front of the cop. That's Boothroyd who gives it to Saunders. Brian Parkin must have got the angle right really he shut Saunders down the best way he could and the Liverpool top scorer put it wide pounder free kick Carl Saunders was fouled by uh, Burrows well, there's some legs in this cup tie yet you know because Rovers haven't buckled and they're sending Billy Clark up again for the free kick. There's 
Carl Saunders. This is White. Devin White. Shot struck Mark Wright and it fell nicely for Liverpool. McManaman rushed to his left. Saunders further over. Can he take him on on the inside? He does. Still McManaman. Great run. It's Saunders. And this time the finish is short. And Dean Saunders with his 20th goal of the season beats Brian Parkin and as soon as comes off the bench you feel that maybe the resistance and resilience of this gallant Bristol Rovers side may have been broken if it has the man who's done it is McManaman again lovely run opened it right up but that's a drilled shot inside the near post by Dean Saunders making up for his earlier miss and it's 2-1 to Liverpool Marcus Stewart here Rob Jones wasn't going to let him get past. Throw to be taken by Boothroyd. Rob has already made up his mind to come for this and he got tangled up with big Devon White. It was a marsh clearance to rush. And a splendid piece of control by the Liverpool centre forward. Not matched by the pass, but it was by the tackle. Rush is really back. And Saunders had two to beat. And there's just about a minute left here at Anfield in this uh, of the 90. In this um, FA Cup replay. It's Liverpool leading 2-1. Not the most memorable match for David Burrows he's uh, all right there though and not the easiest of cup ties for the first division side Mark Wright is uh, taking a chance there in the last minute I don't quite know well it doesn't matter now it's uh, Houghton Dean Saunders on the left he's got Rush in the centre this is Houghton, and now it's Redknapp. And again it's Redknapp. Well, into time that Brian Hill may see fit to add on for stoppages, and Robelaar seems to be playing a game of his own back there. Rust has all come from him in this second half. Marsh, the two lads who came into the team at the beginning of the season, combining there for Liverpool. It's McManaman still. Oh, no. Oh, it might be for Rush. Defender's getting a bit tired. And Liverpool will go to Ipswich on Sunday in the fifth round. Steve McManaman, on his 20th birthday, turned the game after an uneasy first half, Liverpool came good. McManaman equalised and Saunders got the winner. But Bristol Rovers and their supporters will know that it was a great credit to their side that they pushed Saunders and Liverpool all the way because his namesake got a cracking goal in the first half and it was needing some skill of the McManaman style when he switched flanks to really turn the match in Liverpool's favour. But Bristol Rovers will be remembered, as will Carl Saunders, for their contribution to the FA Cup this season. They lost 2-1, but put up a great fight. It's Liverpool who go to Ipswich. Well, Steve, a good way to celebrate your birthday, really. 20 today. Um, yeah, well, um, the most important thing was we got a win, but um, the goal made it a special day. What about the uh, change of position for you in the second half there? You were on the left in the first half, on the right in the second half. Yeah, it was um, a half-time, Mark Wright, um, the captain said, swap with Ray Houghton, see what it's like on the right wing. And um, I got plenty of the ball and I was getting a lot of joy, so we just stayed that way. The field really seemed to open up for you there when you were cutting inside on your left foot. Yeah, well, um, there was always a lot of space, even on the left wing, and um, I think that's where we are going to find most of our goals, at least. Gave you a hard game again, didn't they, Bristol Rovers? Yeah, well, we totally expected it. They gave us a hard game at Swerton Park and um, they battled very well here. I think it's significant, Rush's return, I think. 
him in the second half liven things up for us greatly. Mm. When you're playing against Ian Rush, you never get a minute's peace. I think he is the very best at unsettling defenders um, because he's pace. Not, he's not only quick physically and got the legs to get there, but mentally he's very aware of what's happening around about him. And he makes life hell for defenders. And he made them look jittery all of a sudden in the second half because they weren't quite sure where he was. When he was there, he was getting a toe to things. And um, he changed things for us as much as McManaman did tonight. Ipswich away now. Any memories of Portman Road, good or bad? I've lost there several times. <laughs> Um, that'll be a hard game for us. They're going well, they're an attractive team, they'll play football. Um, under John Lyle, they'll attempt to play football and it could be a really good game on Sunday. Trevor Brookings here, McManaman's got the right accent for a Liverpool player for sure, but it was his night. Yes, I mean, I think the fact that uh, Graham Sunes gave me and Russia a lot of credit, I mean, his movement does help the side, but for me, Steve McManaman, his individual skill, his ability to pay, take on defenders was the difference between the two mm -hmm. sides. Funnily enough, in, in the first half, uh, when he was on the left hand here, um, I mean, Bristol Rovers frustrated Liverpool and him exceptionally well. I mean, he makes a bit of space out wide because he does love to, to run at defenders, but you can see David Mehew, uh, uh, the right side midfielder, tackling back, helping out Ian Alexander, the right back. And, and that was the story of the first half. They, they really did work hard, shut down the space, uh, and as I say, frustrated and went in one nil up. Then second half, uh, interesting to see it was Mark Wright who made the switch. Yes. But I mean, Not uh, the manager. That's right. Here, great awareness. Look, he turns. And once you're actually facing the defender, you're in trouble as a defender because you're suddenly running at him. Drops the shoulder, comes inside. He's probably thinking about now whether I go outside but he carries it on to his left foot, which perhaps isn't his favoured one, and hits us. Terrific shot. And that is early in the second half, and, and from Rover's point of view, the last thing they want. But here again, he has a quick look round, weighs up the options. He's got terrific balance. Any dribbler has to have good balance. He, he thinks about the cross, knows he's going to get blocked out, turns back out, extra gear of the acceleration, a little shove off from the tackle, and at that stage, the defenders are worrying about a penalty. A hard cross ricochets off a defender, could have flown in the net. And then the icing on the cake, well, Bristol Rovers have a shot themselves. And at this stage, you think, well, from Liverpool's defensive point of view, just relieve the pressure for us a bit, Steve. But he, he gallops away and you'll see him drop his shoulder, come back inside, takes three defenders out. Ian Rushes pulls the defence to the nearest post and he lays a, a beautifully weighted pass that Dean Saunders hasn't got a control. All he's got to concentrate on is, is putting the ball in the net. And, uh, you know, all individual sort of aspects of a forwards play Steve McManaman showed tonight. Beaten yep. Bristol Rovers in their fourth round replay at Anfield. It was Carl Saunders' goal ten days ago that forced the replay and he was at it again last night, giving Bristol Rovers an early lead. But thoughts of another cup upset were dispelled soon after half-time. Steve McManaman, 20 yesterday, bringing Liverpool back into the game before disappearing under a pile of grateful teammates. Apparently recovered, McManaman then set up Dean Saunders, his finish sending Liverpool through for a fifth-round tie at Ipswich. It was were leading, and the result didn't spoil a night of celebrations for the thousands of Bristol Rovers fans who made the journey north. Our own Roger Malone was with them. Over 7,000 Rovers fans made a great impression at Anfield, giving their heroes constant support, with the noise being turned up even further by the 18th minute Carl Saunders goal. That brought Rovers a deserved lead at half-time, but as their supporters celebrated during that interval, Liverpool were reshaping their attack, devising new tactics. And Steve McManaman's switch to the right wing was to equalise superbly. And as the famous home team found vintage form and put Rovers on the rack, Dean Saunders scored the deciding goal. Now the cop could celebrate. Now Graham Souness could see his stars had at last tamed their stubborn visitors. But Liverpool's former stars and current ones still marvelled afterwards at the number and enthusiasm of those Rovers supporters. In all my years here, even in the derby games, I've never ever seen a way support like that. They should, well, give themselves a big slap on the back. Marvellous. Oh, they were absolutely fantastic, you know, they brought thousands along and uh, I think that's what kept um, Bristol going in the second half, you know, they, they looked tired, but uh, I think when you've got the, the crowd like that behind them, I think, uh, you know, keeps them going and, uh, no, I think everyone in Bristol should be proud of themselves. Rovers' Ian Alexander wanted to savour the memory with his two small sons. Andy Reese remembered Liverpool's second-half transformation. Uh, when we came out, there was a different team. Um, the first 10 minutes was a telling point, really. They really came at us. Um, they got that goal just about 15 minutes into the second half. And then, obviously, the tide had turned. 
Rovers' manager agreed we'd seen a superb partnership of team and supporters. Yes, I think it was. I mean, I, Liverpool beat us on the pitch today, but I think our fans would feel they won their battle on the terraces uh, in the nicest possible way. Um, and it was nice to see that uh, the crowd applauded both teams off at the end. So that was pleasing. Um, and I feel that uh, over these two games, we've, we've established Bristol Rovers a bit more. And as reporters waxed eloquent about a great cup tie, Rovers fans went home, defeated but not downhearted. I thought they played very well. I think the best side on the night won. Steve McManaman was outstanding, but uh, very good support and unlucky. I thought they played well. They were unlucky. If only they scored that second goal in the first half, they would have had a good chance. Had a good time. Very good. Brilliant. Okay. Yes, I bet they were all late for work this morning. Well, Rog, all in all, quite a cut run for Rovers. And, of course, the one thing they're left with, apart from memories, is a bit of extra cash in the bank. Absolutely, Richard. It's estimated over £120,000 made from the cut run. That'll be very handy if uh, Dennis Rove wants to buy a player to consolidate in the league. And, of course, Rovers' support uh, evidenced in these last two Liverpool matches... Uh, shows all the authorities how, how big a following there is for that new stadium the Rovers want to build. And uh, all in all, it was quite a night as we saw there. Absolute wonderful night. One of the great cup ties. Rovers deserve that lead. Liverpool were great in the second half as they got the result, moved on towards Wembley. Let's not forget, still Bristol City and Swindon Town still on that... at the Liverpool ground for one of the great games in the history of Bristol Rovers. One, two, Bristol Rovers fans were determined to make a day of it, whatever the result. More than 7,000 made the trip to Liverpool. Many arrived early enough to take in the atmosphere of the famous ground. When the teams arrived an hour before kick-off, they both heard the same song, and it wasn't from the Liverpool fans. And as they took to the field, you might have thought it was Bristol Rovers who were playing at home. Their supporters consistently outsung the Liverpool fans on the cop throughout the evening. Rovers were the better team in the first half. Liverpool didn't look a class side. Devon White had an early header, but it went straight to Grobelaar in the Liverpool goal. But after 17 minutes, Liverpool failed to clear the ball, and it comes to Saunders, who takes his time to shoot. Good volley! Oh, yes! What a start for second division Bristol Rovers! The Liverpool defence was lax, but it was a well-taken shot. It gave Rovers a deserved lead and sent their supporters into ecstasy. Rovers deserved that lead at half-time, despite Alexander clearing a right header off the line. Manager Graham Souness must have lashed into his team at half-time. They could have scored three times in the opening ten minutes of the second half. Ray Houghton's shot here was deflected, but McManaman's effort was perfectly placed. McManaman's shot! Oh, didn't he open them up? McManaman was already causing serious problems down the right. This was a superbly struck shot to equalise. Dean Saunders missed an earlier chance but didn't fail to get on target after McManaman had raced the length of the field to set up the winner. Still McManaman, great run, it's Saunders. Despite the result, Rovers fans continued to outsing the cop and at the final whistle gave the players a marvellous reception which continued long after the teams had left the field. Because the support was magnificent for both teams, I think our support has been like that all season, but they just outsung them and it lifted the team first half. Our first half performance was magnificent. And over the two games, we've, we've let them know they've certainly been in the cup tie. At the end of the day, they were just, just probably a bit better than us and they made it tell on the night. The fans tonight? Excellent. I think we lost to Liverpool on the pitch, but I think our fans won off the pitch. Quite a night. Oh, we really had a great time there, didn't we, Mark? Yeah. She came from the home side for Scythe's cross, met by an inventive overhead kick from McMinn, but Williams firing over. Rovers had their chances, but Ian Alexander surely ambitious to try and catch a goalkeeper of Peter Shilton's experience unawares. An easy save for the former England keeper. 
His opposite number, Brian Parkin, had a much busier afternoon, doing well to get a hand to a difficult downward header here. Derby again over the top. And then it needed an inspirational tackle from Rovers on loan defender Kevin Moore to deny Derby after Geraint Williams was put clear, Parkin again alert to the danger to make safe. Derby controlling the midfield and winning most of the ball in the tackle, again were frustrated by the Rovers keeper. Ormond Ride's shot superbly saved. And as the sleet descended at the baseball ground, another Rovers free kick, Derby back in numbers seemed to have it covered, but perhaps there are too many of them there. Clark's challenge allowing cup hero Saunders a shot inches over. Well, early in the second half, Derby took the lead, a cleverly floated free kick, a looping header from Coleman, Parkin left stranded. On the replay, watch how as Devon White misses the ball, Coleman has the space and the time to place that header perfectly. Good goal. Well, straight from the kickoff, Devon White was put clear. A familiarly wholehearted challenge from the big striker, winning the ball well, only to shoot tamely at Shilton, and as more Rovers converged, the former England keeper dropped thankfully on the ball. And Rovers again denied by Shilton and the Derby defence. Knees, legs, elbows, anything in the way from Derby to deny Rovers and secure victory for the home side. Well, disappointment then for Bristol. So Rovers kicked off with a side which had lost their last game 1-0 at Derby. Rovers ahead with Steve Cross's long throw, White flicks it on, Saunders joggles and holds it and makes progress, Mayhew into a good position, hooks it through and then Devon White gets it in the net. White's 11th goal of the season, Rovers ahead after four minutes. Now have another look at how White begins the number nine there behind the action, but he can see what's going to happen if Mayhew can get it right, then he accelerates, out goes that long leg, beating Cooper there, the Millwall number three. Rovers a goal up, but Millwall back on terms, I'm afraid. The ball's cleared out by Andy Reese from this corner, but Mayhew, the hero in that goal now, in trouble, and Goodman punishes him. As you see again now, see it come down, Mayhew doesn't get into a good position to clear the ball out, and it goes back to his own defence has come out, the Blues are all missing, and what a nice finish by Goodman. Well, now, uh, in the second half, Rovers... Up here from Parkin coming up. White flicks it on. There's that man, Mayhew, always sniffing out a chance and a lovely finish off his left foot. Mayhew having a very eventful game today, in the action all the time. Not all of it good, but this is good, isn't it? White didn't actually connect there, but his challenge helped make the opening and a lovely, deft placement by David Mayhew there. Good finish. Well played. So the Rovers back in the lead there. Well, they had uh, been e caught on the equaliser, but here's Devon White with the winner. <laughs> I'm not sure that was an own goal or not, but apparently Devon White's been credited with it. Well played, Rovers. Well, well, Swindon, score. Swindon there, disappointed they didn't win it. Rovers were to lead through a combination of Carl Saunders's good ball control, then David Mayhew's assistance, and finally Devon White arriving on cue. 1-0 and 11th goal of the season for the transfer-seeking White. But a self-inflicted setback as Rovers are caught at one all. Mayhew will be disappointed as this ball comes down and he doesn't prevent it being projected back towards his own goal, where John Goodman has equalised most adroitly. In the second half, though, Mayhew was to atone with a very skillfully taken goal. That's a lovely lob. David's first goal of the year. Rovers' defence, though, beaten by Goodman's sharpness again that sets up Chris Armstrong's equaliser. Finally, last minute drama, Davison's ill-directed throw, Reese is alert, White's boring through, it's in the net, White justifiably celebrates a dramatic team victory, but uh, have a look in slow motion and you'll see it's an own goal, that's Phil Barber's shot, the Millwall number nine, just connecting first there, he meant to hook it wide of his target, but it's in his own net. However, it's Rovers' third successive home win, which cements their recovery in the league. And further evidence of Dennis... Dennis they return. Well, Rovers began to dig their own grave. Their handball by Billy Clark in the penalty box after 12 minutes. Slow motion there reveals how Clark does handle his team. So went a goal down as Andy Fensom put the penalty home. But Rovers were to enjoy a lucky break as the first half to develops because uh, an own goal was to send them in at half-time level. It's Neil Heaney 
the culprit there putting the ball in his own net. But Cambridge's double substitution early in the second half really revitalised their attack and watch this super header from Dion Dublin making it 2-1. Well now one Cambridge substitute makes the centre and it ends up with another Cambridge substitute, Ledbetter, making it 3-1. So that's good managerial work, isn't it? Bringing on two subs who combine like that. And soon it's uh, Heaney making up for that own goal with that shot. And finally it's another number seven, O'Shea, who gets the ball in the net. So it's 4-1 as Heaney gets congratulations for his part in it. Now it's Dublin again, far too strong for Rovers in the air, but was he well marked? One thing sure, it was 5-1. And once again, Rovers vulnerable at set pieces. A substitute Taylor makes it six goals to one. In this first meeting, it, it was obvious that Rovers gave so much, uh, Bristol Rovers, that is so much respect to Blackburn. There's Atkins slotting the first goal with uh, loads of space in the penalty area. One thing that uh, Bristol Rovers have to do tomorrow, Roger, it's to close down all the space, make it very, very difficult. Lovely one-two, give and go there. Great finish by Scott Sellers, who's come back from injury this year and playing very well, apparently. Again, you see all these goals coming down from the left. And Atkins again scores this one after the shot from Cowns is beaten out. In you go. Scored about three goals in 15 minutes. They've got to give him no... Comes all about getting the ball under control and on target before the tackle comes in. There, he hardly breaks stride. One of Carl's 15 strikes this season. Only from David Mayhew of the Rovers in the win over Millwall. Now, as this one builds up, watch for the accurate touch that Mayhew shows to lift the ball over the goalkeeper there, yet under that crossbar. That Two million pound signing Roy Wegeley was paraded before Twerton Park today, but almost immediately after kickoff, Bristol Rovers had Kenny Dalglish's glory boys under pressure. But Blackburn came back, and it was only a magnificent save from Brian Parkin which kept the visitors out. In the 26th minute, Blackburn's defence make a mess of it. Andy Reese wins possession and slides the ball to a charging David Mayhew. With just an inch of a gap under the keeper, he slots home Bristol Rovers' first goal. A spate of bookings shortly afterwards, this foul coming up on Devon White leads to Blackburn's Chris Price having his name taken. Just before half-time, goal number two for Bristol Rovers. A long Andy Reese ball finds Carl Saunders. The defender takes a close look at the grass and Saunders is on his own. His chemise tries to send the defender the wrong way. His shot rebounds for Devon White. Let's again see the skill of Saunders going to the left, then the right, before letting loose and coming oh so close with the keeper beaten. Devon White doing what he does best, snapping up the loose ball. In the second half, Ian Alexander's free kick was headed back to David Mayhew, who hit it on the volley. His second goal and 3-0 to Bristol Rovers. The replay shows it was a Blackburn head that set up Mayhew. A class goal, though. Blackburn finished with a flurry. A speedy header was going to be saved by Parkin in goal. In another Blackburn attack, Ian Alexander's boot stopped a goal. He was on the line. So, 3-0, a good solid win for Bristol Rovers over a top team. Yes, indeed. Despite some action, this was in the first minute. But Rovers had two clearer chances. This was Ian Alexander. And later, Carl Saunders was close. It ended one all. Devon and Wolves. This was destined to be an historic night for Steve Bull, but it was a couple of early chances that stole the limelight first. Tom Bennett was close for Wolves, and then Ian Alexander was narrowly wide with a well-struck effort from 25 yards. But the second half yielded the two goals, Rovers scoring first after 53 minutes, a deft finish from Devon White. But 13 minutes from time, Bull scored the equaliser that puts him level with Wolves' all-time goal-scoring record. He's now scored 194 goals for Wolves, which equals the record set up by John Richards. As for when he breaks it, well, that's likely to be sooner rather than later. This Extra Time programme on HTV West in answer to a question from the audience about gamesmanship in sport. But unfortunately, there are players, and I'm not frightened to say it, who are a disgrace to their profession in the way they behave and what they get up to on football fields. I mean, our lads played at Cambridge recently, and uh, you've got the situation where 
Cambridge are taking a throw in on the touchline and they can throw it all, all the way into the penalty box. And their player literally picks up a handful of gravel off the side of the pitch and puts it on his hand, rubs it on the ball, and when he actually throws the ball in, so when our player heads the ball away, he's got gravel all around his face. Rovers' virtues of tenacity and uh, persistence showing up there, and Carl Saunders' his goal touch, his 16th score of the season, in a victory that owed much at the back to Rovers' uh, efficient defence. Moving up to Newcastle... ...at home this year, their goalkeeper is likely to have been a big reason, yet again. On just three minutes, Rovers nearly took the lead, Justin Skinner's strike hammering against the upright. The replay shows how Skinner expertly killed it round the wall, so close to being one of the goals of the season. Barnsley proved difficult to penetrate at the back, always defending in numbers and hoping for a breakout. Devon White, one of the few Rovers players to force a save from Lee Butler. Dennis Rove's injury hit squad soon had another casualty, Steve Cross colliding with Neil Redfern. After lengthy treatment, he was stretched off and could be out for some time. Later reports confirmed he'd broken two toes. Barnsley seldom posed Rovers defence many problems, most threatening David Curry. This jinking run, though lacking a powerful finish, Brian Parkin has it well covered. So in a goalless first half, the home side most dangerous attacking up the left, Tony Pounder's charge this time cynically brought to an end. In the second half, Rovers did get the ball in the Barnsley net, but Carl Saunders, a judge to have pushed illegally on his marker, white shot disallowed. Almost immediately, Barnsley floated across into a tricky wind. Parkin punched weakly, but Curry shot wide from a narrow angle. Rovers also exploited the wind. Steve Yates curling the ball onto the head of Devon White and a good save from Lee Butler giving Rovers their first corner. Towards the end, Rovers also forced several free kicks, but the wind made it difficult for them to find their targets. Devon White unable to set up a scoring chance, but the ball falling for Tony Pounder. He was well policed by the Barnsley defence and all in all, a frustrating afternoon for Bristol Rovers. Well, the man with... Rovers go a goal down after only three minutes. They clear the first ball, but Billy Clark does not block the second one, so it's south end goal for Keith Jones. And it was early second half before Rovers equalised. Alexander's through ball, Mayhew's good finish, two good players on the same wavelength, David Mayhew's ninth goal of the season. Two minutes later, Rovers in front. Bloomer blossoms into an attacking fullback. And then watch young Marcus Stewart with class finish. Good control, one, two, in the net. That's why he's a highly rated young player. Then Rovers stretch their lead, and who's going to be credited with this goal? Certainly, Justin Skinner lets rip. Certainly, it deflects in off John Taylor. Most of the players say, give it to Taylor, because Skinner's shot might not have registered. And it was John Taylor, too, to be credited with the fourth goal. Good positioning from the new signing from Cambridge. Nice sharp downward head, a little bit of help. The ball gets in, they all count, and Rovers enjoy counting. One, two, three, four. And intriguingly, what Rovers fans were chanting, you cannot have our Steve Yates. Well, time will tell it. Bristol Rovers. White has also left us, gone to Cambridge. He benefited from these passes from Skinner all season. There's the final one. Nice placement from Devon. The big fellow scored a good few, made a lot more. Goodbye, Devon. It's been nice to have had you with us. Goal C. Goal E is scored by David Mayhew of the Rovers. Mayhew with a textbook demonstration of a powerful, accurate, volleyed shot. Have another look at it to see how he gets his body over the ball to keep it down. And the placement is perfect. Rovers' long trip bore fruit with John Taylor's deciding goal. The only score of the match. And certainly Rovers' new signing is justifying his arrival from Cambridge because this was his third goal in his three matches for Rovers. However, Rovers still needed good work from their outstanding goalkeeper, Brian Parkin. All in all, it's a victory Rovers believe secures second division football for next season. Back in the West Country. In fact, it brought a rocket for this week. Rovers created very few scoring chances all match. When Saunders did get an early effort on target, Kerslake diverted it over to rescue Swindon. It often became a case of Swindon against the home goalkeeper. Terry Gibson in, thwarted by Parkin. 
Swindon's better passing certainly set up numerous raids, but they lacked enough impact from their strikers now that Duncan Shearer's been sold to balance the budget. Swindon's system released the fullbacks to attack often, and uh, there's a good shot there from Kerslake, but again, Parkin holding out. Finally, it needed uh, Swindon's defender, Sean Taylor, to get them a 75th minute goal. Their fans could now hope for three away points at long last. But even on a bad day, the Rovers do have fighting spirit and their blanket assault on Alexander's free kick brought Clark, the defender, his first goal of the season. So that long unbeaten home record that's lasted all year was preserved. At least the Rovers crowd could celebrate that. Swindon can still reach those playoffs, but only if they give uh, opposing goalkeepers more difficult work than the excellent parking mostly thrived on yesterday. From Tony Pounder, Marcus Stewart set it up with a ball across the goal mouth and Pounder just reaches it. Taylor's first came from a Mayhew header. He connects to volley it in. In the second half, Ian Alexander's high ball nearly goes adrift, but Mayhew rescues it to send in the perfect centre. Climbing to meet it, John Taylor for his second goal. Then from a corner, Taylor repeats the aerial performance, out jumping the defence for the hat-trick and his seventh goal in six games. Rovers began by making it a terrific run of 15 home games unbeaten this year with Tony Pounder's goal there. Then it was to be John Taylor's first goal, underlining what an excellent buy he's proving for manager Dennis Rofe. Brighton have Ray Wilkins' brother Dean, and it was to be his perfect centre picking out Mark Gore for a very nicely taken goal. So something then for the visiting fans to hang on to during their long journey home in bottom place. But the match was to prove the sense of anticipation from John Taylor to get airborne first before defenders and so score again. Yes, this is a John Taylor made for goal scoring. His hat trick was to make it seven goals in the six matches since he arrived in a part exchange deal involving Devon White leaving the Rovers for Cambridge. So far, Taylor proving a more than adequate replacement. Ball goes in. Stevie Yates actually with a known goal. He's just got his feet in a, in a bit of a mess there. Should have maybe cleared it with his right. I wondered what Dennis must have thought when he saw that going. Thought, oh crikey, caretaker manager, here we go. I don't really, I've got no chance of getting the job. But to be fair, Bristol Rose have done superbly under Dennis, under, under Dennis Smith, under, under Rofi. Mm. Pounder with the cross, far post, Reece sticks it in. Good goal that. And they get themselves the three points on the day. With a lovely move here, a lovely little dink in by Alexander. Chest down by uh, Big Devon, 20 minutes sticks a goal in the six. Those fans thought new striker John Taylor had used up all his goals for the season, then they were wrong. The hat trick hero from last week's Brighton game made it eight goals from seven games with a fifth minute strike against promotion hopefuls Middlesbrough. And he almost made it nine, only the woodwork depriving him of another score. But his earlier strike was enough to give Rovers a half-time lead. Well, we can see if that... ...who are also chasing promotion. Bristol Rovers went ahead through John Taylor. That's Taylor's eighth goal in only seven matches since signing from Cambridge. In fact, Taylor twice went close to increasing Rovers' lead. Yes, Rovers' much improved side could have put the game beyond Middlesbrough during the first half. However, after the interval, an outrageous equaliser from Paul Wilkinson, who clearly put the ball in the net by hand, not head. Slow motion will prove that the ball gets nowhere near Wilkinson's head. There's the hand knocking the ball into the net. Nothing wrong with Wilkinson's second well-taken goal, but all of Middlesbrough's promotion rivals are set back by their three points that ought to have been only one. Allison sent off, slow motion uh, gives you another chance to decide if the referee was right on deciding on serious foul play or violent conduct there. Well, with Ray Atterveld becoming involved in a different incident while play was halted for Allison's dismissal, the Dutchman was also sent off. And would you believe, five minutes later, Mark Azelwood sent off for alleged foul or abusive language to a linesman, so City down to 
eight men and they ended up losing by five goals to two and the season in 17th place. Swin Rovers held on against a classy Charlton before snatching the only goal through David Mayhew and maintaining that splendid record of being unbeaten since last November at Twerton Park where prices will go up next season. So the Rovers and the City survived, those relegation worried. Bristol City had little to lose going into the final match of the season, but they ended the game with just eight men. Wayne Allison sent off for this challenge on Barry Ashby. Azerwood and Atvel both followed. They all faced bans, which will hamper the start of next season. City finished 17th, but it was an eight-game unbeaten run after Dennis' a frustrating season. Their 2-1 defeat on Saturday ended hopes of a playoff place, but they had often threatened to break into the top six, only to fall back. It seems incredible, Swindon sold. Top victory on Saturday allowed Bristol Rovers to finish 13th. Crowd problems, though, spoiled the end of a successful season. After Dennis Rofe replaced Martin Dobson as manager, Rovers' fortunes turned. Had Rofe's success been extended over the entire season, Rovers could have been in the playoff zone. Well, on to cricket. And